Good morning, everyone. Um, this is kind of a, a nice, nice treat to be here in person um, and to be here on the property. We do have a public meeting of the Massachusetts Gaming Commission, and I will not need to take a roll call. Today is Tuesday, October 24th. It is public meeting number 483, and it's my understanding that I turn it right over to Andrew Stephan, a man who's wearing multiple hats these days, the Senior Regulatory Manager and Interim Sports Breaking Operation Manager. Good morning, Andrew. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners, Chair. Good morning, all. Thank you. Um, my name is Andrew Stephan, um, Casino Regulatory Manager for the Gaming Commission, working out of our Gaming Nation office here at the Andrew Park Casino. I don't have much prepared in terms of a presentation. I'm certainly leaving that for the PPC teams. But I will give you a very brief backstory on the topic at hand today uh, before turning it over. Um, so sometime dating back to 2019, um, I was approached by PPC on the topic of becoming a cashless casino. Now back in 2019, I had never heard the term before and certainly didn't know what it entailed or how any of it worked. But as we do through the years, we've had several meetings and discussions with PPC. We've had internal meetings, external meetings. Um, and we've come to learn that cashless doesn't, isn't just cash. It's not the concept of not just inserting cash into a slot machine, but it's cardless and contactless too. And what we now know and call is uh, triple C's. Um, as I said, we've had several meetings, and even more so over the last 10 months or so, um, certainly since sports wagering has been implemented and legalized here in Massachusetts, uh, cashless or triple C has become part of a regular topic of discussion uh, with our bi-weekly meetings with the compliance teams. PPC has even offered several presentations and demonstrations, most recently as of last month, um, showing everything from how the player uh, uses the app on the phone at a slot machine to how the back-end reporting and financial systems work. Um, so uh, this has certainly been on the minds of PPC and Penn Entertainment for several years um, and perhaps took a back seat to sports wagering over the last year or so. However, this is still something that PPC and Penn wish to implement in the casino here in Massachusetts. Um, and that's what brings us here today. Uh, PPC will provide a full presentation and a hands-on demonstration where you'll get to feel and see the actual application at a slot machine. Um, so without wasting any more time, I will turn it over to PPC General Manager North Grenzel, who will introduce his team, who will then give the presentation. Great. North. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Thank you for being here today. Um, <coughs> I'm joined today by a couple of members of our corporate staff, so I'll start with Rich Cremas, our Chief Information Officer, Brian Wozleski, who is our Corporate um, Vice President of IT. I'm also joined by Chris Soriano, our Chief Compliance Officer, and Sam Haggerty, who is our Deputy Chief Compliance Officer. So, appreciate them being here through, uh, here with us today. They're going to walk through some, some of the technical aspects, some of the regulatory issues that um, surround this uh, technology. But I wanted to take just a second to kind of set up before I turn it over to them um, a little bit about if we think of you know what this technology has looked like and, and what how gaming has evolved and I, and I always go back to thinking um, my very first job in a casino was in Harris New Orleans in 2001 um, and at that period I remember standing back as a fresh NBA graduate sitting outside of the cage and watching people throw bags of coin over the counter to people to, to replenish and there was this whole process as I was in this management rotation program of how we dealt with coin and how we dealt with cash and what we made the the customer go through just to use their own cash and what we did to handle that on the back end in terms of bringing money out to the games if you're a customer and you just wanted to move one game to another you would have to cash out it would produce all of this coin if the machine didn't have enough money we would have to bring more out to it you would then take that coin and then insert it into another game and it was just this crazy process that as an outsider you looked at and said oh my gosh this is just insane and then fast forward to 2003 where the ticketing technology came out and that was something that was broadly seen as, as a win for the customer um, because it was less time that they were sp uh, spending standing in lines less time waiting to use their own money um, and we kind of have stayed in that place since 2003 if if Burke were here today, I would give him a hard time about um, being in Atlantic City in 2003 at Showboat 
um, with our 3,000 slot machines and going to the process of going to a cashless casino and kind of living through all the pain of being in both of those worlds um, for a long time. Um, and in that time in 2003, when I think about it, it was one of those instances, okay, well, so we went to this cashless technology. We went to a ticketing technology. But at that time, there were still transactions that I as a person was conducting in cash, right? I would say, you know, if I were to put a percent on it, I'd say maybe 30, 40% of my transactions, just as a consumer, were probably conducted in cash. And that's the place where we've been living since essentially 2003. So in 20 years, as I think about my experience as a customer um, and the amount of transactions that I do personally in cash right now, I would say it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of less than 5%. And, and whereas I would have expected some transactions to be in cash um, 20 years ago, I think now I look with a degree of skepticism on any business that demands that I conduct all of my transactions in cash. It's just. It's foreign and it's different, and it's not where customers are at this point um, in the vast majority of society, right? Um, I think about this morning, I ordered my coffee. I did not use cash. I ordered it on my phone. It was ready when I went to go pick it up. Um, and so there have been all of this innovation that's happened all around this, is, this issue. And we, for, for very reasonable reasons, have, have decided not to pursue that path. There are regulatory concerns that, that people have that are valid. Um, there are consumer concerns that people have. I think we're at the point now where we're able to address those. And so um, I wanted, before I hand it over to them, just to be a voice for the customer and say, you know, at the end of all of this, we're talking about something that it will make it easier for guests to be able to access and use their own money. It does not interfere in any way with the current systems that we have. Um, They're not required to use it. As a system, it is an option that is available for them to use. So uh, I appreciate you indulge me, indulging me on the, uh, the history lesson, as I get a little bit older, those times that I've been able to think back on um, help me kind of frame things up from, from where we are today. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Rich Primus, and he's going to walk you through um, some of the ins and outs of the technology. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Actually, Brian's going to give you the details on the technology. I'm going to do a little more history and a little more emphasis on customer. Um, the reason we're doing this is for the customer. We want to be able to avoid customers having to stand in lines, avoid having to get card reprints. I mean, it's a very frustrating thing for a customer having to wait in a really long customer service line to get a little plastic card because the first C of our three C's is cardless. So you can just go cardless and not cashless even if you wanted to. So we want to give our customers flexibility to engage with us digitally however they want to, but not limit them from playing the way they were if they prefer to stay the way they were. So cash still works, Tito still works, it all works exactly the same. This is an additive technology to give other people, like North, who want to engage purely cashlessly, I think that was a word, to engage with us that way. I was actually at Chase Field as a Phillies fan at a Diamondback, Diamondback game this past weekend with my son. The entire arena was cashless. No cash accepted anywhere. Cotton candy guy, I went to give him some cash and he just gives me a card reader. So it's... Our customers are rapidly getting used to environments where there is no cash exchange unless you're my father, who prefers to do all of his transactions in cash and gets frustrated with that. But by way of a history, a um, little bit of more history, we've been thinking about this for quite a long time, as North said, long before the pandemic. But the pandemic was an accelerator for us to work with certain jurisdictions to make our customers feel more comfortable, to have to interact with people a little less, to have to handle cash less or at all, to not have to touch screens that people were not comfortable touching. So myself, Todd George, who's our head of operations, we worked with Brian as well and Chris with the state of Pennsylvania. So back in 2021 was our first launch. In June, fact check me on that, Brian. Yeah. June of 2021, we went live uh, with our first casino in Pennsylvania. By that fall, all four of our properties in Pennsylvania were cashless. So at this point in time, we are live in 10 jurisdictions and 21 of our 27 in scope properties are currently live with our cashless technology. And some of those date back two plus years. Our most recent was January of this year, I think our last, our most recent go live. And then we have three more jurisdictions and four more properties that are really in the window of within the next one to three months, they'll be live. So we're really getting to the end of trying to get our, our cashless footprint out there. And an interest, Sam and I were talking, one interesting observation is human nature would say, oh, it's all of our younger guests that want to go cashless. And, and while, yes, the younger guests are interested in cashless, 
we've actually seen a very good spread demographically that 44 to 55 year olds are adopting this technology almost as much as our younger demographic. So it's not skewed directionally one way or another. Um, of course, the, the 65 plus set is probably the last to adopt. They are still adopting, but not quite in the same percentages as the others. But from 21 to 55, very, very similar adoption rates and very, very good customer feedback as well. So we picked really good partners with Acres Technology and Every. The nice thing about Every is our wallet provider is they integrate with the Cash Club and the ATM, the, 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 the ATMs on property. So it's an integrated solution. And from a regulatory perspective, they're licensed pretty much everywhere Penn has a footprint, which was also a really, really good decision for us. So Brian's going to take you through a little more of the, the process and how our customers engage. Um, we can talk about the responsible gaming components of this because it's something we're very, very passionate about. We spent a lot of time. And then I just leave this as this solution was designed highly collaboratively with regulators. Pennsylvania Gaming uh, uh, Control Board had a lot of influence on, on how this solution rolled out because they were the first to go. But also, and for me, most importantly, is we did it with our operations partners. So our property teams, our gaming operations teams, our surveillance teams were heavily involved in the design. This wasn't Rich and Brian and the corporate IT team go behind the closed doors, build something for six months, and then roll it out and say, look what we did to you. It's, it was a collaborative effort, focused on the property, focused on the customer, and uh, we're really excited to show it to you today. And please, at any time, questions, of course. People want to sit in these empty chairs. They should just to do is walk you guys through the solution itself, okay? how it functions and how it's, how it's architected. So our contactless solution really has two key primary functions. Number one is cardless. Uh, what does cardless mean? What cardless really means we're going to allow the customers to get rid of their plastic layers. Right? So today, every machine that goes cardless, cashless has a new card reader on it. That card reader actually functions just like every card reader does today out on the casino floor. Right? You can still use your plastic card, it works fine but it also has a Bluetooth beacon, right? And what that allows us to do is a customer can actually use their mobile device and they can say, I would like to card into this slot machine. They can hold their phone close to the slot machine and it cards them in just as if they were putting a plastic card into that machine. Uh, key piece there is there's no critical information, right? The mobile app itself is not providing any main, any, any kind of personal information. It's simply passing the uh, player's card number just like the player's card would be encoded on the uh, magnetic strip. Once carded in, I have some options. So number one, I can actually card into a separate machine. So the system is created so that we can actually card into two machines at once. Um, technically, Bluetooth can go to, to 10 machines, but just from a use usability function, we limit the two. So the customer can still play two machines at once. Um, and then again, you're tethered with that Bluetooth connection. Right? So if a customer chose to, they can go on their app and they can say, I want to card out of this machine, and they can card out. But also, uh, just as a fail safe, if they actually walked away, the Bluetooth, once they exceed a certain threshold of signal strength, it'll actually card them out of the machine just as if they pulled that player card. Uh, again, the, 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 the card readers are exactly like it is today. The plastic cards work. And the way it works is, again, if you're connected via Bluetooth, somebody puts a plastic card in there, it'll actually detect, uh, it'll detect that, and it will um, kill the Bluetooth connection, and the uh, card will overlap. Um, Brian? Yes. That signal strength, about how many machines away does it then? So, so it, it's based on, on signal strength. There's a lot of variable, a lot of variability in that. So again, if you have a thick case on there, if you have a, um, a an older phone, right, it, it varies. Uh, what we try to tune it for is between five to seven feet within that machine. Um, again, some some phones have great great uh, receivers and can go a little further than that. Um, some have weaker receivers and can really just stay within that two or three feet there, right? So it's kind of a, it's more of an art than a science, right? Because you're dealing with all these variabilities of phones and cases and, and other signals that are going through the property. So we try to tune it to a point where, again, it's not going to card out if somebody puts the phone in their purse sitting in front of a machine, but, but tight enough so they can't walk out of the property right to tie to it, right? So it's, we try to tune it to about five to seven feet, but again, it's based on signal strength, not distance. Does that make sense? 
So that's cardless, right? And as Rich stated earlier, um, cardless allows you to you can play cardless. You don't have to do anything with cashless. You can simply just replace your plastic player card and again play with your with your phone. Just following up on Commissioner Skinner's point, so if it didn't pick up and the person kind of goes several machines away, another patron comes in and sits down, they can theoretically continue playing on They can. Now, if they put their plastic player's card in there, it breaks that connection. If they and, do. And, right, if they put their player's card. If they don't, then, then yes, if you get too far away, uh, you could, somebody else could get in the middle there. The but nice part about the solution, that. we have seen yeah. to a small degree. Yeah. The, the beauty, though, is, and the nice part about it is, it, it, all the transactions are captured, right? So if that occurs, we have that data and we can see exactly what occurred. And again, our, our uh, we have the reporting in place so that our slot ops teams can actually go out there and figure out exactly what occurred and uh, and keep things. We also have procedures. Our, our surveillance teams have access to all the analytics as well. They can see transaction level detail, game level detail, player level detail. So in the rare instances where it occurs, because you know every technology has some some threshold of, of, of challenge. Uh, the resolution process has always been very simple, actually. I also think it's important to note that we we train all the customers when they adopt this technology to actually hit the button to right. sever the connection. So that the walkaway is just a backup option. We want them to actually take. It's just the same as they should take their card out, right? We want them to actually take it away. So we do train them to do that. Just following up on the chair's question. So theoretically, uh, patron. I can come and um, win a jackpot, let's say. I still have the capability to cash out at that machine. In other words, the play and therefore the winnings, they're not associated with the patron who used their, their card list so to that machine, right? So once they get, they break that threshold, no, they would be carded out and the winnings wouldn't be be attributed to that 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 former person. Does that answer your but the, provided that the new patron cards in. Provided they do card in. But yes. if I if the new patron does not. If the new patron does not card in and and for some reason someone stayed right there, that that, that could occur. Again, we have not seen a great degree of that occurring. And again, if it did, all that data is tracked, right? So again that data is it's it's sitting there and, and again the slot ops teams can go ahead and make sure things so are I haven't heard I haven't heard anything about jackpots going to the wrong person. Yeah, no, it's just, yeah. so my point is, though, um, there's still the capability of someone new to come and cash out there. The winnings wouldn't be associated with the, the person who just got up and Correct. left. Correct. Okay. Yeah, that, 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 that could occur. Okay. The, the other thing is the, the, the number of times we see sort of the walk away incident is far less than the number of times a property deals with somebody sitting down and hitting somebody's Tito out for them. That, that's a more frequent occurrence in side. today's world. Yeah. If somebody forgets the Tito yeah. out, if they card out but they forget to cash out on the machine, mm -hmm. people could theoretically yes. come and yeah. hit the Tito out. That happens far more frequently than what we're talking about. And that's about. a lot more difficult to track than yeah. it is. Right, because we don't have all that transaction level detail at that point in time. Then you're going to cameras and trying to walk back the film and, and whatnot. Yeah. So I really want to get to the heart of Commissioner Skinner's question, which is, doesn't this open it up for nefarious actors to invent new ways to be nefarious? And how are you, how are you guys going to, how are you working against it? And how are you going to work against it? Because it's going to happen. Cyber. Yeah, I, I, I would say, Commissioner, um, obviously, I think anytime you adopt the new technology, there's always these potential, there's, there's always new ways where we have to be watching and monitoring. Um, we have top of the line authentication protocols, security protocols, um, back of house auditing, et cetera, um, some of which I think we can explain in more depth, uh, but would probably implicate some cybersecurity questions and concerns, and so I think we could discuss either doing that in an executive session or submitting a supplement uh, based on that. Um, but I, you know, Rich, Rich and his team and, and, his, and their security team are, are working closely with our partners as well to constantly be evaluating any sort of opportunities and threats. It's, you know, it's, it's no different than when Tito's first came along and people tried to find ways to get around that system. And even some of us who are of a certain age remember the quarter on the yo-yo that folks would use in, in the slot machine. And so you know, we know that the threat actors are out there um, and, and our thinking has evolved along with that to, to, to try to stay ahead of it. Yeah, I think, I think 
we have some very good answers to those questions and we invest a lot of time and money on cybersecurity. The connectivity with the phone and the biometrics in the phone also is, is key, but I think maybe um, you know, that's something we could provide a deeper answer for in an executive session or offline. I think it's great. Yeah. And it is, it's my number one question when it comes yeah. to So the second half oh, oh, sorry, I already advanced my is cashless. Again, as, as Rich has stated, cardless can be used without cashless, right? So that you can just replace the plastic players cards, uh, eliminate the lines, so there's a big win there. If they choose though, they can use cashless. What cashless is essentially is it's based on a digital wallet, similar to a Venmo, similar to a, a, a PayPal, where again, you will we work with a company called Every, and again, they manage our wallet, and they, they uh, are, are responsible for kind of all the financial transactions going in and out of that wallet from banking institutions. Um, customers will sign up for the wallet. They need to go through a KYC process to get the wallet. Uh, at that point in time, it's, it's a traditional bank account. It's a Wells Fargo bank account that sits behind the scenes that's in that customer's name. Um, what the customer can then do through the mobile app, they can access that wallet and they can deposit funds through, based on the regulatory environment and the regulatory um, jurisdiction, based on, on those, those funding mechanisms. It could be um, bank accounts, it could be PayPal, it could be Apple Pay, um, it could be debit cards, it could be credit cards, except in Massachusetts. Um, again, that, that, that will not be allowed, and uh, we can track that as well and prevent any credit card funds that go into that wallet from getting to a slot machine, or getting into your wallet, or getting to a slot machine in the state of Massachusetts. So uh, that one is covered, and I think Sam's gonna talk a little about that um, later in the presentation. Um, once your wallet is funded, a customer can card into that slot machine via their mobile app, and they can indicate they want to put funds onto the slot machine. Uh, very quick, within two or three buttons, you'll get to see it uh, very, very shortly. Um, it'll go ahead and take those funds. They can specify, I want to put $100 on the slot machine. They press the button, and within one or two seconds, those funds will appear in the slot machine, and the balance will get back. Um, vice versa, at the end, once someone's done playing, I can choose to card out. At card out, it will take the funds on the slot machine and then move them back into the customer's digital wallet. It's a very, very simple, very fast um, process. Madam Chair. Yes. So, to help walk me through the um, technology of the slot machine itself. Do you need new slot machines for this to happen, or is the ones you have currently being current, able to adopt? Current slot machines work as is. Um, and again, why don't we take two, sli two slides, Rich? is our architecture, so how this works, right? So there's really three key components to this, this solution. Number one is the slot machine, as you discussed, with a, a Bluetooth card reader in there. Um, number two is the digital wallet we had talked about, and then the loyalty app itself. And the key point here is the loyalty app is simply a user interface, it's simply a keyboard, right? There are no transactions or data or money or anything flying, flowing through that, that loyalty app. We actually utilize is a company called Acres. They have a product called Foundation. And think of that like a, a middleware broker or a, a traffic cop. And really it, what it does is it's passing messages between the digital wallet and the slot machine itself. And we connect to the SaaS port. And what we can do is basically send those um, credit and debit transactions to, this, to and from the slot machine. And then that Acres Foundation is responsible for communicating again between the wallet and the slot machine. So the way it would work, the mobile app would say, hey, I want to go ahead and put $100 on a slot machine, one, two, three. It would tell every, hey, take $100 from this person's account, push it to slot machine uh, one, two, three. The wallet would say, got it, they have the balance available to them. It sends a message to Acres Foundation. Acres Foundation says, oh, I know where the slot machine is. And it talks directly to that slot machine and says, um, increment, increment the cashless meter on that, on that slot machine. Those meters are meters that are inherent in all slot machines today. Again, as they, as they, as they built the slot machines years and years ago, they had all different types of meters. We're going to increment that meter in that slot machine through that, that SAS um, And then vice versa, if we're pulling float funds off, the app tells the wallet, hey, go ahead and pull the funds off of slot machine one, two, three. It tells Acres, Acres talks to the slot machine, wipes those funds, and then tells the wallet how much it should. The, the game's unchanged. The CMS, the casino management system, is unchanged, but it inherits the transaction information for reporting purposes only. So. We've, you know, we've worked with both of our, we use two different casino management vendors, Aristocrat and Light and Wonder, 
and all of their reporting inherits all, all the correct information from the game as it would today. So the CMS is not affected by this one bit. So the Bluetooth card reader is the new technology that we're putting in there. So in the machines themselves is the Bluetooth card reader that goes on there. And then there's a little box part of this foundation. There's two components to the foundation. One is called a blender. Think of it like a server that sits, again, behind closed doors here at the property. Right? And that's the, that's the thing that actually controls the communications. Inside each slot machine, there's a little red box, about that big, that connects directly to the SAS port, and the blender can talk to that little box in there. So when we talk about upgrading your machines, we're talking about two things. One, adding the card reader, replacing your card reader, and then two, putting that red box inside the slot machine, connected to that SAS port. And Sam's going to address at some point um, our concern about making sure that no source of payment is secondary credit either, right? Yep. Absolutely correct. Clear. And again, the last piece, and Rich alluded to it, the gaming system still, still sitting there, remains unchanged. It's continuing to read the same slot meters that, that exist today. So again, uh, what you're going to see is in the reports there, we take the existing reports that you utilize for audit, utilize for revenue. They'll go ahead and show these cashless transactions by reading those meters that are already on the report. Um, We'll augment those reports by adding the extra cashless column because today most properties the cashless column is not visible in the report. We'll make that visible and, and you'll be able to go ahead and check um, revenue and broken down by again cash versus TO versus uh, cashless. Okay. Madam Chair, so I guess at some point we're going to hear from our team about security and how they feel about it and that it's good for the consumer and things of that sort? Is that forthcoming or, or a little later in the presentation? If it's not today, it can be another time. Um, we may we have the option of executive session if there's any questions that Chris and team feel that they rise to that. Um, Councilor Grossman in that room would advise us. I don't think today the team is prepared. Um, right. I think we just wanted to get an overview yeah, of, of so. the technology today. Okay. We'll so move into the next phase. Because at some point, we would have to act, right? We'd have to take action to... By a regulation or otherwise. Okay. Thanks. So while we're putting the wish list of, together of things I'm interested in seeing, I'm looking right at Chris, um, which, not in a box, which is nice. <laughs> um, you know, I'm thinking about the KYC piece. If you have a cool mom, right, who hands you that, that digital app, Right? Because now it's not a card. A physical card may make me a little nervous to walk in with somebody else's name on it. I'm interested to see how you guys are thinking about and how you've dealt with getting 20-year-olds off the floor, right, that look kind of close. Maybe they got through the, the front door, and now they've got this app on their, their phone. So I'm interested in hearing that, too. I'll touch on that, Commissioner Mayor. All right, thank you. Any other questions about the solution, the functionality? Again, we'll go through the demo. Um, you can actually get to touch it and use it uh, in the next room. Very okay. Sam. Okay. We'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Those of you I have not met, I think I've met almost everyone on the screen, but I'm Sam Haggerty and I'm Deputy Chief Compliance Officer and Regulatory Affairs Counsel for Penn Entertainment. So uh, we talked about this a little bit, but um, obviously we are aware of the statutory prohibition in Massachusetts on the use of credit cards for gaming activity. And so we've actually worked with our partners to develop a specific solution for our cashless wagering system here in, in Massachusetts. Um, we're going to have a solution where patrons are unable to withdraw any credit card funds. This includes secondary sources such as Apple Pay and PayPal, um, as Madam Chair mentioned earlier. Um, it also includes credit card funds deposited outside of the Commonwealth. So we'll have different buckets of where, what types of funds are available and anything that is connected to a credit card in any way they will not be able to use for gaming activity in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And the solution is currently in the final stages of development. It'll be ready next month, and we're happy to have you know any testing or questions that everyone has on that once it's once it's implemented. 
in terms of technical questions today, I'm sure we can answer some of them, but you know, you'll also be able to see it when it's ready. Sam? Yes. Could you clarify, when, when you say unable to withdraw any credit card funds, could you elaborate? Yeah, of course. Because what I hear is that your mobile wallet can be funded using a credit card, but they, the patron would be unable to utilize those funds at a slot machine. Is that Correct. Unable to fund in Massachusetts. So in the state of in the state of Massachusetts, you would not be able to fund with a credit card. You're okay. geofenced in. We know you're in the, inside the state of Massachusetts. A credit card funding option would not even be available. Okay. Okay. However, if you're in Pennsylvania, which allows credit card funding, you could theoretically fund your credit card in Pennsylvania. But our new technology has a way of knowing that that source of deposit was a credit card. So as soon as you come into the state of Massachusetts. Those funds that we've identified as credit card deposits are also not available for play. So inside the state of Massachusetts, you can't fund. And if it was funded somewhere else, you cannot use funds that were put in by a credit card. So credit card play will be locked down within the state of Massachusetts. Thank you. so exactly You're welcome. Exactly the same Okay, so now we're going to talk about responsible gaming. It's extremely important to Penn. I know all the commissioners are aware of that PPC is, you know, a big proponent of Play My Way. I'll address that up front. Um, this is a complementary solution to Play My Way. It does not interfere with Play My Way in any way. It's actually just an addition to Play My Way. So Play My Way will work the same way on the slot machines. We'll just have these additional uh, options for patrons that I'll talk about. So first, any patron in order to sign up for a digital wallet with us, they need to sign up through our Pen Play loyalty mobile app first. They have to sign up for an account for that. That includes our KYC upfront. That includes the fact that no self-excluded patron will be able to sign up for the Pen Play mobile app and therefore they'll be blocked from making a digital wallet as well. We also have secondary KYC in that. So in terms of any fraud concerns, underage concerns, we do our KYC through the Pen Play loyalty app. And then when they sign up for the digital wallet with Every, Every does their own KYC. And that includes identity verification, making sure that the person's of age, that their identity is correct, that they have the bank account. Um, all of that is done twice. So there's two levels of protection there. Also, we always have responsible gaming information available to the patron within our app. That's not going to change. It's been the same you know, with our mobile lo loyalty app since we started it. Immediately upon a successful sign up for the digital wallet, patrons will pre be presented with the option to set deposit limits on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis. I think it's also important to note that we have daily, weekly, and monthly velocity limits anyway that they can't go over. So. I'm not sure the exact numbers, and I'm sure you guys know the numbers better, but we have blanket limits that apply to everyone, and then they have the option to set additional limits. They can set it through at any time. They don't have to do it when they sign up, but we give them the option right away, just, hey, you signed up for a digital wallet, you have the option to set these limits, so we want to teach them right up front. Um, and then also they can just go through that and set it, and I have some screenshots that I will show you guys about how to do it, and I'm sure when you have the demo, We'll explain it as well. Sam, can I ask you, so the limits that you predetermine are the defaults, is that only using the app, or does those also apply to the card? So is this an extra limit? The velocity limits. This? this is on this deposit. Is. This is on deposit to the digital wallets. Right. They wouldn't apply to just a plastic card. A card, right. Okay. Yep. But Play My Way would continue yeah. to be in effect, right? right? So they couldn't play more than they actually budgeted. Right. We don't currently have any wallet that exists right now on property, so there would be no way for us to So the to card, you can just keep going back, right, and reload it. Right. Correct. So the right. card right now, there's no, right. if you have a plastic player card, there is no wallet that you have. Right. There's no funding mechanism. Everything is through cash, currently. Right. And there's no cap on it. Correct. Okay. Other, correct. Yes, ma'am. Well, physical, yeah. I mean, correct. There's correct. No correct. Physical limitations. Right. Correct. Yes. yes. I think one additional call out, if somebody sets up a wallet and a pen play account and then later excludes themselves, 
they immediately lose access to those accounts, the, 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 the app. They, they, they're, they're, they have no more access to the wallet or the app, and then we would you know, refund the money at an appropriate time. So it, it, we protect people if they, if they disassociate <coughs> after they've already established the account, because we have to you know, make sure that they are not playing them. The, yeah, the I was wondering, it's usually yeah. the next hours or days it goes back. So that, that's going to depend on, on the mechanism by which we discovered right. that they were excluded. Oh, okay. There are certain yeah, ways that the reg deals with, the list. there are certain ways that the regs deal with what we are to do with the cash that the VSE has. Well, I'm, I'll say, this is, right. let's say it's the scenario where they haven't been since mm -hmm. they're putting on their list. Correct. So in that instance, I believe that it the, would probably go back under the funding mechanism under which it came right. in. Right. So if it was an ACH, it would be a reverse ACH. Yeah. Did you say the amount? Uh, the velocity the controls, controls. So the velocity controls are at, by default are three thousand dollars. So a customer three thousand. So a customer cannot deposit more than three thousand uh, in, in a given day. And that's across all your jurisdictions. Across all jurisdictions. That's all. Yep. But again, the, the, and the limits would be on top of that, yeah, the, right. the optional limits. And then I, this is also an important point, I think. Um, once they set a deposit limit, the patron sets a limit, they can't reduce, they can't make that limit different. They can make it less if they want to have a, a less option to deposit less money, they can do that. But um, if they try to go over the limit and it increase it. Let's say they did a hundred dollars a day and they want to make it two hundred. They cannot do that until the period of time that they've put on there is ended. So if they had a hundred dollars in a week, until that week is over, they cannot go over it. Yeah, they can't. They can't increase the amount you know, to play, and they cannot reduce the time on the time limit. So if they made it for a month and they say, well, it's been a week and I really want to play again, it doesn't matter. You can't change it to a week. You can change it to two months. You can always make it more strict. Mm -hmm. You can never make it less strict once you've set a limit. Sam, I, I still have a question on the KYC stuff. All right, I completely understand the, the verification on both the account and the app, and understand that. The scenario I'm bringing up is more of an underage and an AML scenario, which I imagine we can't talk about in this room right now. But you know, Chair Judd Stein signs up. It's you know, all, all good, I'm using her as an example. Uh, everything's all good, it's her, you know it's her, it's her account, it's her funds. Now she hands me her application ID and her password. I download it to my phone, okay? Log in as if I'm chair. And I walk up and hit that. I wanna know what you guys are doing to make sure that's not happening. Because I imagine, right, people get new phones, people get new devices they're going to be able to log in from one device to the other. What's to stop someone from logging into someone else's device when they've given them the password and the, the access? That I, I, you know, I'm trying to wrestle with that in my head. So that I would say that the same things that apply to a person who would walk in with a Tito that their cool mom gave them, <laughs> or walk in with cash that their cool mom gave them would apply here as well. In other words, we have a policy in terms of who we ID at the doors. Um, in terms of saying, like, if they look below a certain age, then we'll request an ID. What about the drug dealer? Like, what do you mean, what about well, the drug what, what if they're a 40-year-old and it's, it's an AML situation? It's so there are certain, I mean, all of those processes that we go through for the person who is an AML concern would apply here as well. Mm -hmm. So all those things that we do from an AML perspective to determine source of funds would be the same thing that we would do here. And the one thing that I'll add on the most we have, because I'm sharing the same concern, is that it kind of could happen in the card, but Sam's point earlier, it wouldn't have the benefit of the transaction. It's so it's much awesome. easier to hijack an account than something different. I'm just throwing it out. And, and the other thing, I, I just want to kind of go back to, I don't know if maybe I misunderstood Commissioner Skinner's question from earlier, and it was surrounding jackpots. I just want to be clear that we have instances today where we need to verify who actually 
press the play button before that jackpot was triggered and confirming the identity of the person to whom the funds are supposed to go. So in, in that instance where, you know, if somebody was carted in with the, the mobile app, um, they win a jackpot, we're still gonna go through those same procedures. And um, we have instances now where the team may say, I'm not sure that the person who's claiming this jackpot is the person who should receive the funds, right? Um, and so we go through a verification process um, that involves a couple different technologies now. So that, that would still take place here. You know, if somebody is, is using a mobile app, all of those same procedures would, would go into place. We have obligations that are federal obligations to make sure that the person who triggered the event is the one who's receiving the paperwork that's associated with that event. And I also want to add that we designed this technology in mind to go back to Commissioner Maynard's point a little bit. We dissolved it. We design this technology with the fact that we want surveillance to be able to see clearly what's going on. So, I mean, there was a lot of trial and error on making sure that this is visible to surveillance from up there. And so they can see everything on the cameras up there so they can flag it, or if compliance flags it for them or one of those systems, you know, we have the tools to go back and look and make that, make that right. And all the DOR cross checks, all that stuff, Absolutely. Yes, that's correct. Yes. So in terms of responsible gaming, we also have the options to set up email or text alerts with the patrons daily, weekly, or monthly summary of their usage. So they just have the option to kind of keep themselves in check and keep a record. They can also always go into the app at any time and look for their pending transactions, a specific time frame in the past, or a specific transaction or amount. And that, that one sounds interesting to me because I'm trying to think about the sports wagering context, right? So you have your, your phone with both, you know, your, your PSI and your, do they, can they set up those kind of email text alerts on the PSI sports betting app? I think, I think so. I'm not sure I understood the question. The question can they set up for pen play? Mm -hmm. So you're when you're using the sports, sports betting app, and are you able to do app. notifications on the sports betting app in terms of your yeah. cash in, cash out, all of those yeah. notifications? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah, I believe so. Yes, yes. <coughs> we can we can follow up. Yeah, uh, we'll follow up with the interactive team just yeah. to double check, but I'm pretty sure yes, they can do that. As and well. I see Mark Vanderlin, and I was thinking about the whole conversation about mm -hmm. if you get reminded, is it an incentive to go back, or is it an incentive to realize how much you've mm -hmm. bet? Mm -hmm. So. Right. Yeah. I know we had that conversation on the sports, but it's like, you know, it's just this. Right. Right. Yeah, and there is that, there obviously is that question. Uh, another, another point that we talked about before, and I want to make sure it's clear, is that um, in terms of the, the limits and just even if you don't set a limit, if you fund the account with $500, it doesn't auto replenish when that $500 is gone. So once you, gamble through that $500, you have to make the specific decision to refund, and there's a bunch of screens and messages that you go through to do that. So it's a deliberate decision by the patron. You can't auto-fund your account. So this is just kind of a screenshot, and you, you'll all be able to see this when we demo the actual technology, but I just wanted to show you kind of how you can set these deposit limits. Um, we have options, you know, you can set any kind of limit there. Um, and then you can also enforce it one day, seven days, 30 days, custom number of days up to a year. Yeah, up to 365 days. And then that limit is set for that specific amount of time, no matter what you do. You can't, I mean, I mean we can't even get around it. Like, no. They have, you can't go to, you know, a, an employee, not that, obviously not that we would do that, but an employee doesn't even have the, ability to do that we it's set and it's done so that's that's how the, the limits work Madam Chair. Yeah. so this is the first screen I'm going to see after you sign up successfully and you go through the KYC I think that's it for my slides so happy to answer questions or show you the demo or both and thank you so much to everyone for making the time to come today we really appreciate it so Sam, just following up on Commissioner Ryan's point, you know, that 
the feature of the tax on its face sounds good because it, we know where the intention is coming from, but it will be an interesting question to explore. And I know Martin Warner's here today from the council along with Mark Engelman and to explore um, sort of the science um, as to whether the tax is helpful or not. And we've had that debate. <laughs> I have to say, personally, I am much more at, my, my husband would point out that he created a, a little bit of a monster by really nailing down my inability before to use my Apple Watch to pay, because I was having sort of physical problems, and the beast has been unleashed, so <laughs> I'm pretty facile now. Um, where if I have to look in my purse for the, the twenty dollar bill, yeah. so there there are responsible gaming issues, and I appreciate that you've taken that look, and we also appreciate I think I can speak for all of us your you know your commitment to play my way and to responsible gaming, but uh, I don't know if you've had any research done on you know whether you're getting feedback that it's it's easier people don't want to spend is it easier to spend more easier to gamble more. I don't know if you've had that. So, I mean, as we said, we've kind of been in adoption for about two years in Pennsylvania and slowly adopted throughout the U.S. jurisdictions. I would say, at this point, we haven't had specific research done on it, but we have all of the data, which is great. So, I mean, to obviously, we wouldn't want to share that in a public meeting, but to the extent that that would be helpful, anonymized data, we have all of it, and we can easily provide it, look into it, update it as needed, and kind of look for things. It's kind of crazy the amount of data we have actually so it's which is nice right because we can do those things we can look into it and reevaluate constantly right. sure. I'm truly appreciating the North's benefit of cash and I also appreciate the tools that you're using for the responsible gaming and I think that just may mean that enhanced RG tools to bring us into the century with respect to cashless to just make sure that the beast is a Chair, if I, if I may on that on, on that point, uh, we, as Sam said, we have not had a systematic study of it done um, in terms of the usage of, of limits and alerts. Um, I will say that the anecdotal feedback I've received from other regulators who we worked at, on this is that uh, they view it as positive that we have this in the ecosystem. But that being said, uh, we're more than happy to continue dialogue with Mr. Vanderlyn and with the Commission, as always, on, on this as we all evolve our thinking. Uh, I don't think we intend our limits and protections as they are now to be static yeah. forever. You know, as we as we learn more, as we think of potentially better ways to do things, we're of course willing to embrace that. Can I follow up on that point? And that is, you know, the psychology between how far is the ATM right mm -hmm. to walk exactly. to the ATM, and I'm looking at Mark too. Mm -hmm. You know, recreating that on the app is something I would be interested in. To your point, Chris, which right. is. You know how how do we do that in a way that's responsible and fair and, and, and correct? Yeah, and I was thinking about your your customer experience interruption. The counter to that would be sort of what is it? The urge. They have those meditation apps, right? So you X minutes gets you over the urge to go back and you know eat the brownie again. Um, <laughs> that waiting in line with your Tito ticket or your coinage might have sort of been an inherent part of the experience that tempered spending um, from an RG perspective. That obviously is. I mean, as they've just said, it's, it's not really there necessarily in the app. But to your point, maybe something that needs to be looked at in terms of how do you get that counter in there. Yeah, and, and we can, Brian can demonstrate it, but it's there. there is a, a number of, probably not the same as the walk to the ATM time-wise, but there are, it's not a one click to refund. So if the balance goes to zero, there's, probably what, seven or eight screens, yeah. Brian, and then a couple of confirm, confirm X. So there's, there is a period built in, I think we can, you know, which we think has been fairly effective uh, from that regard. And, and again, it's something, conversations we've had with other regulators who, who appreciated that period of time that it's not a one-click replenish or an auto-replenish. But I, but I agree, Commissioner, it's certainly there, something we can discuss. Are there times in terms of like, you're gonna have to wait two minutes to Click button four. You we, know, yeah, we, we don't have that, okay. uh, but there is there are a significant number of steps. Okay. 
Yep. Well, then I'm going to go back to Sam, give her a chance to read anything before we actually have the presentation of Bernard. You can always do the demonstration and then come back if there are more questions. So that's a, a, a good segue, Sam, because we're trying to figure out um, procedurally how we should continue. And I think that the commissioners would go as a group, and I don't know how much room if you know, team members follow us in as well, but we probably should be all, um, the five of us, because it is a public meeting, and, um, and I understand we're going to rotate our groups through. And then at a certain point, maybe you pause again to be able to ask questions in, a, in, a, in this setting, and then at some point close out if there's still some continuations of the presentation. Is that for me? No. Sam, yes, Madam Chair, that's exactly the plan. We'd be happy to take the commission first. And we're committed to taking as many groups through as necessary. Okay, thanks. I think everybody who's even seen it, I hope it's going to be fun for the camera to show it too. Am I blocking the camera? Fred, you've been seeing the keeper. Fred's good? Okay. Come on, you're guilty of camera. I'm just excited that there's this. <laughs> People still want just no, there's no, yeah, I think it's just decorative. I know, thank you. All right, so what we're looking at here is the Pen Play mobile app. So, this is our traditional loyalty app. So, customers today can go in and see what their, their earnings are, they can see kind of what offers they have, they can go ahead and see what properties are there, they can book hotels, and typical loyalty app. Uh, but we've given it an extra button down here at the bottom, you know, this is 777, that is the cashless button, right cardless cashless, so they can go ahead and click that button and it's going to bring them into the cardless cashless service. That's a big amount. That one there? Again, that's a test. It's test all. <laughs> um, so again, it's, you'll notice there is, again, at the top of the screen shows you what is actually in the wallet itself. So that's your wallet balance. And then you have two tabs here. One is slots, VLTs, obviously in Massachusetts tables with the and then you have two buttons, connect the game, and that means I can connect to two different games at once. Right? And to do so, I would simply click connect the game, and we'll do that. Before we do that, though, we talked about the card readers. And again, that's these, these illuminated kind of card readers that are here. They function exactly like card readers today. Uh, the, what you'll see, though, is once somebody's actually carded in, uh, it's going to change colors for us. Right? Um, so again, we'll say connect the game. It's going to give me a little animation to hold it close to the machine. Say, I have Super Server, Super 7s, this is my game, and I can see my um, asset number here. So a customer can look at the asset number on the game and say, hey, does the asset number match? Right? So they can be confident they're connected to the right machine. Okay? Um, also notice that the card reader went green saying I'm, I'm connected to the Okay. Can I just uh, say one thing? Yep. 211, okay. There'll be some education on this, right? There'll be some education, right? So our marketing teams and our property teams will educate customers um, kind of how this functions. In addition, teaching the customers, hey, when you're connected, we do want you to cart out, right? You don't want to rely on, again, walking away, right? We want you to cart out and train customers. And make sure you're on 2111. Right, exactly. right, right. Yeah. So you don't get all excited. Yeah. You're really over there. Yeah, and you're... Exactly. <laughs> two machine yeah. to, to, to Brian's point, he had to deliberately hold the phone Close about an inch from the reader and that was an intentional design. We could have made it from farther back, but we want people to know what machine they're carting into. So it's sort of... So the disconnect range is long. Correct. Correct. We just want to make sure that they have to select that so they know, to, to answer your question or comment, that they are choosing that game specifically. And to your point, again, it is to connect that's close, and then we release it to stay connected. Right. You so want to put it in your pocket. Or right. Exactly. Right. So Sam, when do you do the training? Um, we, I mean, we do it at launch, so we usually have it at our launch. We'll have customers come in and we'll train them, and then we can keep doing it. But prior to that, I mean, we provide training for all of our staff, and then any MGC staff that wants to come, if Play My Way staff wants to come, like, we're happy to provide the training to everyone. Okay. 
what we've also seen really successful is we set up sort of pen play focus areas where customers can go and talk to somebody about it. They can get help setting up their wallet if they want to. Right. And we can step them through that. So we give them the option of coming and getting, it's almost like going into the Apple Genius Store, a little bit of that experience, very personal touch, or they can do it on their own. We design it to try to make it as intuitive as possible. Yeah, because I was going to say that was pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, this, this is going to be a really short demo. Right. Because <laughs> it's, you can see, okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. So again, um, once I'm connected, I have two buttons. One that says Add Funds, one that says Card Out. Right? I could click the second Connect the Game button, and I get the animation. I can hold it close to this machine. And again, I can see I'm American Beauty. I can see the asset number. And again, I still have my few buttons. Now I can control what machine I'm carting into and carting out of, and I can control where I'm adding funds. So in this case, I wanted to add funds. I said, well, let's add the Super 7s. I can click the Add Funds button. I can specify an amount, and again, I can go incrementally, or I can just use one of the quick add buttons. What are the increments of the quick Uh 20, 50, and 100. Okay, so they don't change depending on the machine? Right? They do not. They do not. And I can click Add Funds, and what you're going to see, it'll quickly go ahead and communicate, and it's going to put the funds in the machine, and then I'll get a success message on the, the app. Here. So, that's going to be confirmed. Okay. Okay. And you can see I have those funds now on that slot machine, and I got a message that says success right on Super Settings. That tells me the amount that I put on the machine. What would be the lowest amount you could pay on this machine? On this machine, the no lowest amount, no cents, so it has to be down to $1. So I can put $1 on the machine. So here you're starting with 20 versus 1 for cash. Correct. Yeah, but again, I can show you, and Woodwood on American Beauty, I can hit click add funds, and I can say I want to put just $1 on there. Oh, you can. I can't do an increment there, so I can just do $1. Oh, on, yeah, those are just the default. On any machine. Oh, so you can do one. Oh, okay. yes. Those are the predetermined. Yeah, I'm just, just wondering, though, no, shouldn't, shouldn't you have a minimum bet option as your default? I feel like, so you're not wanting people to 20 versus a buck. Got it. Um, something to look at, right, to be machine machine specific. Because I didn't see that you could actually do it's the a minimum, one. It's a dollar bet. When gotcha. you said right? 20, so you could do a dollar. Uh, what was it? 20, 50, 100. 100. I know, the quickest thing. That meant, I'm excited. The, fat, the fast cash. Gotcha. 20 yeah. is the gotcha. But oh, like, as opposed to having like a buck. You can just do a buck, but you have to like punch it in. And then I have to do, work. I can do like five, four, five dollars, I can keep it. Well, right. you could even average out the machines. Right. 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 And Brian, it's not impacting your wager. That's just impacting your the load on the machine. Correct. You put cash into the machine. Mm -hmm. But then you can get it back. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You can get back to Tito yeah, or just move like it right yeah. back to their wallet. Or move it right back. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but if I were doing cash, there's no minimum to load on the phone. Like there's if I were putting cash on the phone, right? Like go out with bunk. Yeah, no, there's no minimum. I mean, you can load a dollar on that. Load one dollar. Right. 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 I always play. A lot of people play out. I mean, when I used to play, I would play out to whatever. Right. I would do one dollar. So if I do a dollar, I think I did this machine here. I just did the five dollars there. I did the machine. So you see, I got five dollars on this machine there. Okay. And success. Now very easily when I'm done, I could say American Beauty, I want to card out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to card out, and you'll notice this will go blue. The five dollars will get pulled off the machine, and I'll get notified. Card out. Card, card out button. Blue card out button. Oh, this one. So I'm going to do oh, okay. this one first. Oh, and you're showing you're doing it in the middle. Yep. So you really want to card out. Say card out. So the funds went to zero. The card reader went blue, and it says I've carded cashed out five dollars on the machine. Right back in the wallet. Excellent. And then the last thing is again that walk away again. We're training customers to card out. Right? Yeah. But if for some reason I forget, I get excited and I, I run away, and I'll walk out. And as I break that threshold, it's going to be slightly around the corner. There it is. Yeah, the room. The way to show up on the top. So what happens? It doesn't say hey. It doesn't say hey. It dings. It dings loud. And the money goes away. So it automatically switches. But that's more than three to five feet. That's thousand miles of ten. Thousand miles of ten. Twelve. It is. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
It yes. could. It could have. Again, but we've got that surveillance. Fast, and you've got, we've got yeah, all yeah. the data transactions there, so and, we can and see what they're doing. Primary message is card out. Like, that is not the preferred way of carding out. That's a fail safe. So if somebody forgets, we'll sweep the money back. Can you, can you cash out manually? Like you're on your phone, can you hit cash out and have it do it, or do you have to tell anyone? You can do it on your phone. It's on the phone, you have to do it. You can still hit TVO. You still can make it. So all the functionality stays exactly the same. And again, today, even if someone takes the card, walks away from the machine, again, the same problem exists. This just gives you a little bit more control. And a lot more information. Some more information. Now, you did two games. Mm -hmm. That's the that's limit. Yeah. 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 So I couldn't do these three right now. Um, no. And I think, Brian, 90x percent of our customers do one game. Yes. Yep. Very, very few. Yep. And if they do, it's what, two? It's really that's kind of what you should do, right? And you cannot do more. One thing we didn't mention about cashless, and I, I had mentioned when I was talking, there's a, a safety feature, a, a safety component to this of not having people walk around with a lot of cash and moving it, moving it back, and then you can move it right back to your bank account, so you, know, you don't have to worry about it even phone if someone decides to take your phone. So there is sort of a personal walking safety out. on walking to a parking lot right. uh, with a bunch of cash. I know a lot of customers are uncomfortable with that, so it is an ancillary benefit. If you win big, let's say not, not over the 1200 limit, so that's called taxes. We just win $500 that just stays right in your wallet. Stays in your wallet. And it's when you cash out. Yep. Now, a big jackpot, they still have to come over and process it just like a video. For tax purposes. For tax purposes. It'll lock up the machine. It's difficult. It'll never difficult process. Yeah. But then they walk out without having to get their cooler to put the cash in or something. Right. And even if someone has phone got stolen, I mean, you would need to go through whatever your phone password is, yeah. which, um, or your face ID, whatever your phone is on your phone. That was so and good, Fallowish. Because it gets you know, difficult, right? Because you're going to... That was so good, Fallowish. Carrying the cash in a cool one. Yeah. And then, but someone has stolen your phone. I'm sorry. No, no, say again. I was just saying, if someone leaves their phone at yeah. the machine, it happens weirdly often. Um, if I went and picked up their phone, I would not only have to say face ID set up, if they have a numerical password set up, fingerprint, whatever, <coughs> I would need to bypass that. And then when you go into the pen play app, I would need to put in their password for mm -hmm. that. So you know, you can't really pick up someone's phone and steal their money. So to that point, does that um, time out after a minute or so, the, the screen itself? The screen, it depends on what the customer's phone is set at. Yeah. So, yeah, oh, now, so it's the that's same. A phone yeah. setting. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And then from an, our, our responsible gaming and deposit limits, I can go in and again click in my wallet here. And I can click on the wallet. And load up. And one of my options down here is going to be account settings. And I have the ability to go ahead and do a mobile deposit with it. Now again, the moment I set up my account, before it ever lets me into the wallet, it asks me to, if I want to set up a, uh, a deposit with it. Yeah, so that's so part of the journey on registration. Yep. Right. Oh. Yep. And when we train the, the customer, we tell them that right up front. So in there, I can say I want to set the deposit limit. I would enter in a dollar amount. That was set. And then I would enter in a length of time. And the faults are one, seven, or thirty, but I can put any number of days I want. There are three hundred sixty-six. Mm -hmm. And again, That's that can't be changed by anybody. Not, not, not pen, not property, not even every who runs the wallet. That cannot be changed once it's set. It can't be, not, cannot be less. Right? It can't be. You can make it less restrictive. Right. You can only have one wallet. Correct. Correct. One wallet. I think we have several phones. If you guys want to play with them, do it. On your own, you're more than welcome to. I know that you have questions. Because we're always virtual. Um, we do have one member of the public, but I do want to invite her um, the opportunity to ask any questions or any, um, you know, typical public meetings. We, we can't do that. Exactly. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so I was just asking. Brian might know this answer. Yeah, so every has a voluntary self exclusion program that we encourage patrons to sign up through that 
there's a paper application that someone would get through the cage and the game sense advisor would help them fill that out so they can't access the ATM. I was just asking if someone has BSE through every, if that's going to stop them from using um, the app here. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. If it's through every, so that will apply um, anywhere that that wall is used across the property in any app. Okay. And across all the Oh, sorry, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, I know it's yeah, yeah. and SEP. Yeah. 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 Sorry. sorry. And Sam yeah. added, we have exclude one, exclude and one all policy at Penn. So any any way they self-exclude on any property or any online platform, they're excluded from everything. Then. So this would do PSI policy. or just yeah. This is PSI and So if they did this on this, it would also go to the PSI? Correct. Yes. And vice versa? Mm -hmm. yeah. Correct. Yeah. 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 And yeah, they're, it's yeah. real time, so the minute we enter the exclusion, that app gets shut down, and the end of the wallet has done, and so does your digital wallet as well. So you're uh, that interactive, it's all real time. All of those uh, safeguards for exclusion will have to be. Just the, the, but the every exclusion is, is a separate type of exclusion, and so I don't know how it would what would you re what type of message would you receive or what would the experience be on the app? Right. That would get entered into Pen Gen though, I believe, right? Every uh if, if every does just their own, no, we wouldn't see that in Pen Gen. Um, but again they wouldn't have access to the wallet, it wouldn't load the wallet if you that message. I'm wondering if you were saying you have a ton of data. Um, how does part is for cashless that data is easier to get to than somebody putting cash that's in the machines, right? Because right, that's right, right. that data is not as easily accessible. Cashless, every transaction that occurs is logged with a date and time. I see yeah. four great people with data yeah, exactly. right in front of me. <laughs> 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 Anybody want to use the app uh, itself? It's a great presentation. Thank you. Okay. Are you all set now? Or any? I'm all set. Okay. I'm all set. I appreciate this. Thank you very much. I appreciate you guys coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We did um, present a couple of questions that we thought might be appropriate for executive session. Uh, Councillor Grossman is, is going to have to figure out whether some of the questions fit into um, the uh, Masters of Law with respect to executive session. So it probably does make sense for us, as we discussed, to go through our questions again, and then you'll be able to assess uh, how they can best be answered. So the um, you started with a question um, that if you want to reframe, or not reframe, just re remind uh, Pat and uh, PPC <coughs> of what you'd like um, to just to address, and then we'll see if it's something that can be in an executive session at a later date. Well, first I would like to say thank you for the presentation. It was very helpful. Um, second, I would like to say that even if it's not, um, appropriate for an executive session. I'm fine with waiting until a more, more fulsome answer either way. Um, but my main concern is about the fact that it's really easy to share apps, right? We know that everybody, uh, there's probably people in this room, don't raise your hand, who share net Netflix passwords, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, what we want to do is I, I want to know what's to keep an underage uh, better who got the information from the parent or a cousin or what have you, 
um, from logging in and using this technology? What are you doing to combat that? Um, how is it different than how you're doing it with the, the card and the, the floor today? Uh, I would also expand that um, uh, when I was talking to North to, to AML considerations also, right? How are we making sure um, that uh, folks aren't using this in a nefarious way? And, um, and what do you have in place? What are you thinking about? What have you seen? And going forward, um, what protections are in place? Okay, so we've captured that. you captured that, okay. And I think the only thing I would add to that, just in light of some of the breaches that have happened in, you know, in the industry and some of that lately, just if you're touching on the cybersecurity, and some of that may be publicly disclosable, and some of it might not be, if there's any particular we have. And then I think we had a question uh, regarding whether you had any intelligence research uh, <coughs> with respect to the responsible gaming question around the ease of using cashless versus cash. And I think that Council Grossman had a little bit of concern how that might fit into um, an executive session, but we'll leave it at that. Clarification on that point. I know I think the uh, NDA might be um, an analysis that has to happen. Say again. The NDA, the non disclosure, I think, is that. And then an another area in that regard, we talked about the speed of the transaction. I'm also curious mm -hmm. in other jurisdictions that for a couple of years whether you have historical data anonymized to say whether the average bet changed at all, given the use of the app? Definitely happened. So, um, uh, Commissioner O'Brien was wondering if the NDA might be an option, so we can look at that. Let's try it. All right. Other questions that you've thought of since <coughs> our presentation here and the, present and the demonstration? What's that? I do, have, I do have one thing, okay. Tina, and I know this isn't unique to um, the uh, 3C technology, but um, if you have any information or instances where a patron walked away, still logged into the machine, but then someone comes up and starts to play, um, that would be helpful. And I'm not really sure what information I'm looking for beyond just number of instances, how you, you know, how you resolve them. Just your normal practice as to how you go about reviewing something like that. That's not an unusual question. I think we can give you a really good answer on that. Thank you. So, as we understand, uh, the, the, the uh, PAN team and PPC team will be keeping the demonstration room open for those who didn't participate in the last demonstration. But at this point, I think that we are able to adjourn the public meeting, uh, um, unless there's any other business commissioners that you have. Commissioner O'Brien reminded me yesterday that we do not have to do this by roll call, mm -hmm. so do I have a motion? Mm -hmm. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? All right. Thank you, everyone. 5-0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.